Good morning. It's great to be with you. Let's pray. Father, this morning we pray that the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit would be in our midst so that our thoughts might be in tune with your thoughts, our spirits aligned with your spirits and our hearts beat in time with your heart. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So our reading this morning is from chapter 24. It's in two parts and the first part starts with verse 34. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master abundantly and he's become wealthy. He has given him sheep and cattle, silver and gold, male and female servants and camels and donkeys. My master's wife Sarah has borne him a son in her old age and he has given him everything he owns. And my master made me swear an oath and said, You must not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but go to my father's family and to my own clan and get a wife for my son. When I came to the spring today, I said, Lord, God of my master Abraham, if you will, please grant success to the journey on which I have come. See, I am standing beside this spring. If a young woman comes out to draw water and I say to her, please let me drink a little water from your jar. And if she says to me, drink and I'll draw water for your camels too, let her be the one the Lord has chosen for my master's son. Before I had finished praying in my heart, Rebecca came out with a jar on her shoulder. She went down to the spring and drew water. And I said to her, please give me a drink. She quickly lowered her jar from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I'll water your camels too. So I drank, and she watered the camels also. I asked her, Whose daughter are you? She said, The daughter of Bethuel, son of Nahor, whom Milcah bore to him. Then I put the ring in her nose and bracelets on her arms, and I bowed down and worshipped the Lord. I praise the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me on the right road to get the granddaughter of my master's brother for his son. Now, if you will show kindness and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, so I may know which way to turn. Now, Genesis chapter 24 is 67 verses long. That's 54 more verses than we've just read. So to cut a very long story short and give the Coles Notes version, Abraham needed to find a wife for Isaac, who was the God-promised son that he and his wife Sarah had in their old age. But Abraham didn't want Isaac marrying a local girl, so he sent his servant back to his homeland to find a suitable lady, which was not an easy task at all. The servant was led to Rebecca, who ticked all the right boxes, and when asked, she agreed to leave her family, her home and her country, and travel to Canaan to become Isaac's husband. And the last verse, verse 67, tells us that Isaac loved her, giving us a very happy ending. Throughout his life, the challenge Abraham faced was always the same. Will he trust the Lord God to provide for him and his family and to protect him? Every single time Abraham trusted the Lord to provide and protect, he matured in both his faith and his character. And for the record, the Lord God never once let Abraham down. That should come as no surprise to us, for our God is a covenant-keeping promise-keeping God. This story in Genesis 24 comes at the end of Abraham's life and we discover in verse 35 that the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. Because all the promises Abraham had received by faith from the Lord were inextricably tied up in Isaac and his descendants, Abraham knew that it was vitally important who Isaac married, a decision which would take great faith and much wisdom. At this point, Isaac was 40 years old and he was single without any children, which was obviously a major stumbling block for the fulfillment of the covenantal promises. So Isaac needed a wife. 
but Canaanite women did not make good wives, as his wayward elder brother Ishmael discovered, and that was primarily because they worshipped detestable gods. Abraham couldn't bear the thought of Isaac forming an alliance with some Canaanite woman, someone who would draw him away from the worship of the one true God. And practically, it would have been far easier to choose a local girl, not least because doing it God's way involved a dangerous 1600 kilometer journey. Obeying and being faithful to God is not easy. In the short term, it's often inconvenient, but in the long term, it's always the best move, and the resulting blessings are overwhelming. Abraham, therefore, wasn't being racist or narrow-minded about Isaac only marrying someone from his own tribe. He was being very wise because this was a spiritual decision. As Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, concerning any partnership, be that marriage or business, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Now, this is a tangent, this is a time out, but since it's a question that I have been asked so many times, here very briefly, are the four biblical guidelines for a marriage partner. They are very clear and simple. First, they must be following the Lord Jesus. Second, they must be of the opposite sex. Third, they must not be already married. And fourth, they can be neither a close relative nor under age. Okay, time out over, tangent over, back to our passage. And a good question to ask, why didn't Isaac make the journey himself? After all, he's 40 years old. Surely he's able to make his own decisions. Later we discover in verse 58 that Rebecca was able to make her own decision. Well, the reason is, Abraham had learned the hard way not to leave the promised land unless directed by the Lord to do so. So, for example, in Genesis chapter 12, during a time of famine, Abraham had foolishly left for Egypt and it hadn't worked out well. And most of the resulting problems stemmed from that journey to Egypt. Abraham had acknowledged in verse 7 that the Lord had promised me on oath, saying to your offspring, I will give this land. So Abraham was 100% faithfully committed to his family dwelling in Canaan, which meant that on no account was Isaac to leave the land. He was to faithfully remain and expect God to provide for all of his needs, including finding him a wife. Now in verse 5, the servant asked Abraham a good and wise question. What if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Fair enough. And Abraham's response, if that was the case, was to release his servant from his oath to find Isaac a bride. Verse 8. In other words, Abraham didn't have a backup plan. In faith, he went all in, trusting the Lord God to provide. Now, this has a clear parallel with the ministry of the Trinity to bring sinful people into the kingdom of God. The heart of the Father is to bring all people into a life-giving relationship with Jesus, his Son. And the Father achieves this by his love, his mercy and his grace. The heart of the Son is for everyone to know and be known by the Father. And Jesus achieved this through his sacrificial death. And the heart of the Holy Spirit is to be the agent by whom this is all possible. And the Spirit achieves this when he convicts us with the wonderful gospel message and gives us the faith to believe it. In the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I are called to take on the role of the servant, as depicted here in this passage. Each of us is expected, and we've been equipped, to present the claims of Jesus Christ to everyone we meet, everywhere we go. We are to explain the gospel to them in clear English. We are to recount our own spiritual journey about how we came to follow Jesus as our Lord. 
And we're to tell them graciously that they need to leave their old life of sin and choose to follow Jesus as their only Lord. Jesus, the one who loves them, who died for them, and who will welcome them with open arms. We will only be effective at this if we ourselves are authentic, full-on disciples of Jesus, and if we have a similar heart to the servant, willing to obey our master, willing to be faithful and prayerful, and willing to be inconvenienced and take this gospel to lost people. But we might say, what if the people we tell the gospel to are unwilling to accept Jesus as their Lord? Well, as Abraham said to his servant, that's not our responsibility. Jesus only requires us to be obedient to his great commission. If we are faithful, the Father will not hold us responsible for their refusal. So in verse 10, the servant obediently sets out and he takes with him 10 camels. That detail uh, of the number of camels, that will become very important in a moment. He stopped, verse 42, by a well of water. He arrived in the evening, the time when the women came to draw water. From this vantage point, the servant could study these young women and decide if there was one suitable for Isaac. Wisely, the servant prayed, Lord God of my master Abraham. This servant, although he's now a long way away from his master Abraham, about 800 kilometers, turned naturally to the God of Abraham. Why? Because he's part of the covenant. He himself had been circumcised, chapter 17, verse 23. He was exercising his own faith in the Lord. It's not a second-hand faith, it's his own faith. His prayer, we read in verse 12, was very simple. Give me success today. That's a bold and very specific prayer, isn't it? And he wanted an answer today. I'm sure there are many young men and women looking for a wife or a husband who would like to pray that prayer. Give me an answer today. God doesn't always guarantee to be quite so speedy. But because the servant couldn't stay in Nahor for long, he needed a quick answer. Whatever situation you find yourself in, and however urgent it might be, the number one key principle we learn from this faithful servant is that first of all, as a priority, we must pray. Now, in verses 43 to 44, the servant asked the Lord for a specific sign, that the woman might offer to draw water for himself and for his camels. I'm told that a thirsty camel drinks between 20 to 30 gallons of water. That's 80 to 120 litres. So we know how many camels there were there. There were 10. It meant that she had to draw from the well at least 800 litres of water. At least. That's hard work. The servant had devised an excellent test of character. Because any girl who would freely offer to help a stranger would undoubtedly have a good disposition, and anyone who was willing to voluntarily carry out this onerous task, well, that would be demonstrating humility, industry, good nature, and extreme kindness. Before he'd finished praying, verse 45, Rebecca showed up and fulfilled all the conditions exactly. That's called answered prayer. Rebecca well, she was a child of the desert. It means that she knew all about camels. She knew what she was getting into, but she wasn't afraid of hard work and her kindness was honoured by God. The gifts which the servant presented to Rebecca, a gold ring in her nose and gold bracelets on her arms, they were as significant to her as a diamond solitaire on the fourth finger of the left hand would be to a single lady today. And when Rebecca's family saw these gifts, they immediately knew that a momentous and serious situation had transpired. These gifts were also a visible demonstration of Abraham's wealth and fame. Rebecca then told the servant who she was, the daughter of Bethuel, son of Nahor. To the servant's amazement, Rebecca was the granddaughter of Abraham's own brother. Got to admire the goodness of the Lord. 
an obedient servant who loved his master, had gone on a long and dangerous journey to perform a delicate task, he undoubtedly would have wondered how long would it take him to find the right girl for Isaac, but he was a man of prayer. And no wonder in response he bowed down and worshipped the Lord. No wonder he praised the Lord with deep gratitude. Once again, the Lord had faithfully kept his promise and provided all that was needed. It's very important we see that Rebecca was not in any way forced into this marriage. Verses 57 and 58. Let's call the young woman and ask her about it. So they called Rebecca and asked her, will you go with this man? And she replied of her own free will, I will go. Rebecca's response of I will is typical, not only of marriages, is also typical of the life of the Christian. Marriage is the greatest illustration of the love of, between Jesus and his church, as depicted in Ephesians chapter 5 and Revelation chapter 22. The Christian life is a matter of entrusting ourselves into the hands of Jesus. In effect, the Holy Spirit comes to us and says, Will you go with this Jesus? Will you follow him as your Lord? Will you spend the rest of your life in fellowship with him? And we respond, we say, I will. Consider the invitation. In effect, the servant told Rebecca, there is this man Isaac, and all the promises of God are tied up in him. Will you leave here and go and be with this man as his wife? Think about it. Rebecca had never seen or heard anything about Isaac before this moment. It was all new to her. But now she was being invited to believe that Isaac was real, and more than that, that he was looking for a bride. It's not a matter of seeing. It's a matter of trusting. It's called faith. If Rebecca had not trusted the servant's message, she would never have seen Isaac let alone have had any experience of the purpose of God in her life. Rebecca was being invited to believe that all of the promises of God, the promises of worldwide blessing, all of them were attached to this son of Abraham, to this man called Isaac, to the one she could marry and thereby personally participate in the adventure of a lifetime. The Holy Spirit makes the same invitation to everyone. We are all invited to believe that all of the promises of God the Father are tied up with his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that if we place our faith in him, then out of his fullness, we will receive every blessing that God the Father has for us. Just as Rebecca had to make a personal response to the servant, so too each one of us has to make a personal response to the Holy Spirit. There is no second-hand faith. I have to choose to place my faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rebecca had to face the fact that responding to the invitation and marrying Isaac would necessitate her leaving her old life behind and wholeheartedly embracing her new life. Likewise, every Christian has to leave behind their old sinful lifestyle and wholeheartedly embrace our new life of grace in Jesus' holy kingdom of love. Finally, Rebecca had to consider and respond to the urgency of the servant's invitation. He told his story and then he demanded in an immediate response in verse 49. Her family was inclined to accept the offer. Her brother Laban confirmed this in verse 50. This thing is from the Lord. But they wanted Rebecca to linger with them for a while. Verse 55, let the girl stay a few days. However, the servant will not allow any delay. Verse 56, do not delay me now that the Lord has granted success to my journey. The question is put to Rebecca personally and immediately she says, I will go. 
Many today seem to receive the gospel with great joy, but then they delay acting upon what they've heard. The problem is that delayed obedience is disobedience. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you directly and personally, he expects an immediate response. Anything else, and he leaves. God doesn't do delay. Many, probably most people, will genuinely say, I believe in God. It is, of course, far more logical to believe that there is a God, a creator, a designer behind this complex, wonderful and ordered universe. It's much more logical to believe that than to believe there's nothing behind it at all. It all just happened. However, if they don't want to get to know that God, if they don't want him to be the Lord of their lives, then such a statement is, is worthless. It's empty. It's a bit like saying, I believe in the Himalayas. So what? How will that truth change your life? This is the way it is when God the Holy Spirit invites us to follow Jesus Christ as our Lord. We've all been given by God himself the freedom to respond as we choose. Some will decline the invitation. Some will show initial short-term interest but do nothing. Some will delay and plan to check it out later. And some will be like Rebecca and step out in faith. Here's the challenge. Which one is your response to this urgent invitation from the Holy Spirit to follow Jesus as your Lord? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to each of us and through him inviting us to follow your son Jesus and become your daughters and your sons. We are so grateful. Lord Jesus, thank you for choosing to live a fully human life and to suffer and die so that we could be forgiven and invited to be with you forever. We are so grateful. Holy Spirit, please help us to have the faith to respond to your invitation like Rebecca did immediately, wholeheartedly, and with the desire to leave our old sinful lives behind and fully participate in the glorious kingdom of God. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you so much for listening. May God bless you richly this week.